Okay, uh, let's get started. Thanks everyone for coming to uh, Brain Map. Um, before we get started, uh, just wanted to say that we have now about a dozen Brain Map seminars uploaded to YouTube from the last year, so I'll send out a link, but um, check it out, it's very cool. Uh, and that collection will be growing now um, with each year's Brain Map. Uh, so for today, uh, very happy to have Emiliano Santonecci. He's assistant professor in neurology at HMS, and uh, he's the director of the Network Control Laboratory at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Um, his main interests lie in the combination of non-invasive brain stimulation, electrophysiology, and neuroimaging to modulate brain activity and measure the brain's capacity to respond to external perturbations. He's particularly interested in the development and application of image-guided brain stimulation solutions to increase brain, pl brain plasticity, modulate connectivity patterns, and enhance cognition with the ultimate goal of developing therapies for psychiatric conditions. So obviously a lot of shared interests with us here at Martinos. Uh, today, uh, he'll be presenting targeting networks in the healthy and pathological brain with non-invasive brain stimulation. So a hearty welcome to Emiliana. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me, first of all? Okay. So I'm really happy to be here just to give you a background about why I'm here. Uh, three or four months ago, I got in contact with Apple and Matti here from the center, from the Meg and TMS Center. Uh, because they come to give talks at our TMS course at Beth Israel. And I'm really interested into trying to combine neuroimaging and electrophysiology to find better targets for TMS. And I have a student that wants to come uh, for the second time here in Boston uh, in September. And so I thought this is an amazing opportunity to start working together. So I approached Apple and Marty and they told me, look, you have so many things that you need to start talking about. Why don't you come and give a seminar? But I couldn't come in June, and so we had to reschedule. Now today, neither Matty or Apple are here, so I will send the slides to them. But I'm really happy to be here. I think this is a great opportunity to show some of the work we are doing. As you will see, my style for presentation, it's, I have, I don't know, 600 slides. So I will try to keep it as short as I can. Maybe I will skip some. Uh, but I prefer to give an introduction about many things that we are doing so that we can have follow-up conversation offline if you're interested. Instead of just focusing on one thing because we are doing many that I hope you will find um, interesting. Let's see if this thing works. Okay. So one minute about me. Uh, Jason already gave me an introduction. The only thing that I need to have is that, yes, I'm in Boston. I'm an assistant professor. I have my own... Uh, lab at BI. I'm the director of the CME course uh, Introduction to Transcranial Electrical Stimulation for Neuropsychiatric Research at HMS. So we have a TMS course and an electrical stimulation course and I co-direct the electrical stimulation one. I also work at Northeastern as an affiliated associate professor at the Center for Complex Network Research and you can see why hopefully in a few slides. Uh, and I also work at the Center for Cancer Research at BI and again you will see some of the clinical application I'm trying to put together related to cancer and, and brain tumors. The, the other piece of the story here is that I graduated in Siena from the lovely town of Siena, as you can see in Italy, that's where I'm from. I'm from Florence, but then I graduated in Siena only 30 miles away from Florence. And I'm still the co-director of the lab when I graduated with uh, Professor Simone Rossi, and we do a lot, of, a lot of stuff there. And I like to think about it this way, I do all the crazy stuff there, but it's easier to explain to Italian people when you want to have a crazy idea in the morning and you want to test it in the afternoon. And then when I find something solid, I migrate it to Boston and we scale it up. Uh, that's the model that I'm just trying to push. Uh, in terms of interest, you will see in other slides with more in the details about this, but I do many things. Uh, I'm, uh, I like to explore many things. And, and most of the most interesting one, uh, I won't be able to show today. Among these, uh, I'm studying the neural basis of placebo effects, trying to find a way to induce placebo with brain stimulation as a potential therapy without doing the actual therapy, it's just in just possible. Um, I'm, I'm studying video games and, and I'm doing work on sleep. But these are all things that I would like to share with you, but obviously we don't have time today. Uh, if I have to summarize what I do, I think this is a good slide. So I try to find multimodal approaches to characterize, predict, and modulate brain function. We go from just brain stimulation to connectivity analysis, for structural function, and so on, and combine different techniques. In this case, you're looking at TMS EG data, which is the main method that we were discussing with Apple and Mike, and that could be a bridge between our, our labs. 
if you want to expand the framework, uh, these are all the things that I like to think I'm doing, I am contributed to. Some of them uh, you would see something about today, like non-invasive brain stimulation, connectivity analysis, and, and some brain oscillations. Some of these, I, I won't have time to share it, but all of this stuff, I like to think it's related to, as Jason was saying, brain plasticity and how the brain responds to perturbation. And the final goal is always to go in this direction and find something that I can apply to patients. So two slides about two things that I will not mention, but I, I, I would like to share with you in case you have an interest, we can talk offline. So one is the one about intelligence and human cognition. So I was developing this, this type of work on understanding the neural basis of intelligence and abstract reasoning during my PhD in Italy. And um, as, as a result of that, last year, I, I founded this uh, nice consortium Neuroscience of Intelligence and Cognitive Enhancement is quite a big consortium. We have many faculty from all around the world that try to understand the neural basis of intelligence and now we're also expanding to artificial intelligence. And by that I mean that we have people that study plant biology, we have people that do artificial intelligence at Google. We are trying to bring all the different <laughs> backgrounds to the same table and try to push intelligence research to, to the next level. So if you have an interest, please, please contact me. The other thing, which is very childish, but I decided to put one slide, is to study the impact of video games on the brain. Because I was a video gamer during college. I had my own team, we were doing contests. This is my way to try to make it look a bit more scientific than what it is, I think. But by studying the impact of video games on the brain, we found something, something very interesting. So we could appreciate like structural changes only by playing video games for 30 hours in naive video games using structural MRI, now we are publishing stuff with functional MRI. I look at this as a chance to investigate video games and cognitive training as a potential therapy for patients, obviously. And now we are putting together this and brain stimulation to enhance the response to, to video games. Again, if you have an interest in this, let's, let's talk. Uh, I'm supposed to show you this. I am a scientific advisor for a couple of companies, EB Neuro, Neuroelectrics. Uh, I also have shares in a couple of companies, and the work I'm going to show you is funded by all these institutions. And I have patents in, in a couple of things, among which the, the application of brain stimulation in dementia to reduce proteins from the brain, to induce protein clearance, and application in brain tumors. I will show you both of this in a few slides. So let, let's start. Uh, this is the framework. So we want to target and manipulate networks in the in pathological brain with brain stimulation. So we have a target and we have a tool that we can use. Obviously, I don't need to tell you anything about this because you invented here at Martinez the way to characterize connectivity in the human brain. So you know what this is about. It's, it's a tremendous amount of information that we can get with different modalities and they can explain a lot of stuff, including individual differences, pathology, aging, and so on. So this is what we want to modulate. This is the tool we're gonna to use, non-invasive brain stimulation. Uh, I asked Jason how many of you have an understanding of what brain stimulation is, and I'm pretty sure you all hear about brain stimulation. Um, so I only have like two slides. Um, we like to think about it as a big family with two main components. One is TMS, transcranial mm -hmm. magnetic stimulation. And we are really lucky because the director of our center, the Berens Holland Center BI, uh, is the guy that basically pushed for this the most and got it approved for depression, treatment, and so on. That's uh, Alvaro Pascual Leone. Uh, at the same time, we have TES, transcranial electrical stimulation. So the difference between these two, the first of all, it's in these pictures. So you can see that when you talk about TMS, you talk about big machinery, big hardware. Uh, you need a lot of additional software and, and hardware to make it work, like a neural navigation system. But at the end, it's, it's a neurostimulation technique. So it can induce firing in neurons. It can, um, the, the resolution is quite high. So you can, not surgically, but almost uh, target a specific node of a network and induce a specific response. Uh, it's been approved for, for many therapies, including now OCP, depression, and so on. Uh, these we consider neuromodulation techniques because the amount of uh, in, electricity that you induce at the intensity of stimulation is way lower than TMS, and so it's not, it doesn't make neuron fires, it just changes cortical excitability or, or specific brain oscillations. The advantage of this is that it's portable and it's cheaper, so if you want to translate any brain stimulation intervention for patients into something that they can do at home, or they can buy and do by themselves, this is prohibited, so you need to look at this. I will show you application with both of these. 
When you talk about TMS, you probably know this, but the way to show how effective it is is that if you do TMS on your motor cortex with any device that you can buy, and you record the electromyography from your, let's say, index finger here, uh, FTI muscle, you can induce a muscle twitch. So the stimuli is so intense that you can, the, the intensity is so high that you can elicit a muscle twitch. You can measure the amplitude of muscle twitch and you get the motor record potential, an MVP. And this is commonly used as a measure of corticospinal excitability. So if you repeat this through time, you can change the excitability of the region for a long time, like months. And that's what we do for depression, for instance. We have patients coming in at BI every day. We do six weeks, 30 minutes a day of TMS. It's FDA approved. And that's for treatment uh, resistant, resistant depression. So people that try many drugs and they don't work, then you do TMS. And on the LPFC, can you appreciate uh, clinical effects? Uh, TDCS, so transcranial electrical stimulation, becomes in different forms. These are the three main forms. Uh, came after TMS. TMS is from mid 80s. TDCS started in the year 99, 2000. But as you can see, it's exponentially growing. Many, many people now are using it, and that's why we, we have a lot of interest into these techniques. The three main brothers are TDCS, random noise stimulation, and alternative color stimulation. I will show you application with this and this. Um, they all come with pros and cons, uh, but as you can see, you can do all of these with different devices. And as I was saying before, all of these devices are extremely small, portable, and more or less they do all of these techniques, all of them. The price range goes from $200 to $1,200, uh, $12,000, sorry. So now you have an overview of the target and the tool that we can use. The outline of the talk, what I'm gonna show you is something like this. So we want to answer this question, how, do, how can we get information about network dynamics? How can we causally validate the relevance for behavioral pathology? How, how can we manipulate these dynamics with both either this or this one? So I'll show you these four things. The first one is a series of TMS EG studies when we combine TMS with EG, we do TMS during the EG recording, and we try to probe resting state networks, and we try to see if we can map network specific responses. The second one is an innovative thing. We just published a second paper um, about modulating networks. Uh, it's pretty new, and this is the thing I'm most excited about terms of modulating networks, um, we use paired associative stimulation to change the interaction between specific nodes of a network or between two networks. I will show you a similar thing done with electrical stimulation using multifocal TCS, and then two applications with brain tumors and Alzheimer's disease. This is the thing I'm working on the most, and I think there is a lot of overlap with what you do here and something together, hopefully. But this is the most important message. So I will show you some data, question, hypothesis, idea, almost no answers, because obviously I'm not gonna <laughs> say this works or this, that, and this is all new stuff, some of which is unpublished. So uh, bear with me, and, and I hope I will be able to convince you that this stuff might, might be relevant. So TMSEG. Um, I was telling you how TMS works. So you send the pulse, you record your motor repo potential on a muscle, and you get an estimated cortical spinal excitability. But the idea is that you can keep your EG cap on when you do this, and you keep getting a signal from each EG electrode, and you get what we call TMS EPO potential, a TEP. These basically expand the amount of information that you get, because if you have something like this, you can get the potential from every different region of the brain, multiple times when you send the TMS pulse, and you can see how different parts of the brain respond to the magnetic pulse uh, with millisecond resolution. Obviously, if TMS was not complicated enough, when you do TMS EG, you have to merge all these things together, including EG, so it's kind of a messy stuff. I know that Apple is trying to, to he, has, he has everything, all the hardware, but he hasn't put it together, so we were trying to work together on this because we spent the last 10 years trying to make it work. But again, the idea is that if you send the TMS pulse here, for instance, you can use your information about functional connectivity, structural connectivity, whatever you want, to predict which node will react if you send the pulse here, based on the strength of the connectivity between the node and the other region of the brain. So if you have pulse here and you have very strongly connected region here, you expect after the TMS pulse, which comes with this line, a very strong, and very early potential happening right after the TMS pulse. If you have a region that is not that strongly connected, you might see something smaller in amplitude and with some delay. If you have a region that is not connected at all, you will see nothing. The signal is the same before the pulse and after the pulse. 
So people have tried to do this already. We, we, we are not uh, inventing anything in a sense, except for the network targeting approach. This is work from Marcello Massimini. This is one of the papers I like the most in general. Uh, he basically thought of using the response to TMS as a market of consciousness state. So he published this paper in 2013, but he's been working on this for 15 years now. Uh, it's a brilliant work. So he was recording EG here, then you have a TMS pulse, and you look at the complexity of the trace from 64 channels EG uh, through time, impatient in different uh, level of consciousness, like minimally conscious, vegetative state, normal patients, healthy patients, and so on. So what we found is that if you look at the complexity of this response and how the signal propagates in the brain, where it goes and how long it's, the brain is activated, how long it takes for the signal to decay, it could really discriminate people in vegetative state, minimally conscious state, emerging minimally conscious state, so the patients that are about to come back to conscious, normal consciousness, and healthy controls. This is still not the best biomarker you have of consciousness. And if you think about it with patients, when you cannot ask questions, you cannot get an answer, you cannot do anything, we usually rely on EEG or we usually rely on other measures, but they are crappy. With this one, it showed that if you actually perturb the brain and you look at what happened after TMS, there is way more information after the pulse than what you could record before. So we could apply this for other pathology. We could apply this to explain differences in cognition and so on. I really invite you to, to read this paper. Is there a simple way to capture what that response complexity measure actually is? So he use, um, he basically compressed the signal. He look at algorithmic complexity, and he just compressed the signal and look at the size of the resulting file. It, that's another thing that I found extremely elegant about this work. It's simple to understand, and the method is kind of simple. Uh, but it's a reduction in complexity of the pattern that you can look at because it compresses everything. It doesn't look at where the signal goes, if it goes to the other hemisphere or not. It didn't even look at that. I think there is still a lot of information to capture. Um, in this work, it just compresses everything and says, okay, this patient has a lot of response. Another patient is very flat. That's the biomarker. It's kind of the fact that you respond. Basically. Okay. The, so the topography was kind of lost in this. Yeah. Uh, index. So, what we try to do is to do the same thing with money from the Broad Institute here in Boston to basically characterize this TMSCG, what we call perturbation based biomarkers uh, for neuropsychiatric disorder. Uh, the idea was to test LT controls stimulating different targets. In this case, you can see that the Fulton network and dorsal attention network multiple times, one month apart, to see if these markers are reliable and if they are somehow correlated with any cognitive score. So, as I was saying, we stimulated two networks. So usually people with TMSG don't stimulate networks, stimulate a region like TLPFC, IPL, and so on. We thought that we should actually see if we can engage network and then with source analysis predict the propagation of the signal within the nodes of that network. So if I stimulate the default mode network here, I would like to see that then it activates a node of the default here and then the other angular gyrus and so on. So we stimulated both networks in different sessions and then we tested again the participant after a month. These are three of the postdoc and arrays that work with me on this. Um, we personalized the stimulation target, the DMS target in each participant. We have 24 participants with the TMS EG. As a result, you get TMS above potentials for each participant, and then you can use source analysis to project the signal and see if it really propagates within the nodes of the network you stimulated, if you activate other networks or not, and so on. These are the two nodes that we stimulated, dorsal attention on the right, the right parietal lobe, and the right angular gyrus for the foot mode network. I, I like to show this because otherwise the picture looks too good to be true. If you have never done TMSG, you think, oh my God, this is gonna solve all the problems. It's amazing. Uh, it's actually a mess. So you start from a signal when it's super contaminated by TMS pulses, as you can see, this is a very bad EG. But then you do a lot of reprocessing, a lot of visual expression of data, ICA after ICA, you get something that is reasonable like this. You get the different traces for 64 channels through time after each pulse. We usually do 150 pulses and then we average them. So what you get is kind of reliable, as you can see now in a few slides. So what you get is something like this. Uh, this is stimulation of the dorsal attention, stimulation of DMN. Um, you get different potential. You can see they also look different in time by, by, by looking at them. And you can project it in, in source space. In this case, we use Brainstorm. 
Um, but an easier way to show you is to actually show you the trace over time. So I'm going to show you, this is before the pulse, zero is the TMS pulse, and this is one second after. For stimulation of the dorsal attention first, so you can see what's going to happen here. I found it really, I think it's really cool. Uh, you see a response here, and then another here, and it moves to the other side, kind of, and come back. But it's very local. It stays where you stimulate. It's almost within the network. It's here. Now, if I show you the default instead, you would see a different thing. So when you stimulate the default, the angular child is just not like this. So the propagation is way stronger. It goes everywhere, including the prefrontal lobe, which is the, the red mask is basically the default. So it seems that the signal resonates more in the default network and you get a stronger response than you get in the dorsal attention network, which we found cool at the time when we, when, we, when we look at this data. But the thing that we were interested in was to look at the specificity of this response. So is it that when I stimulate the default, I get more response in the default and less in the AM and vice versa? So we calculated the amount of current that we generate in these masks when we stimulate the default and the dorsal attention. And we also estimated the, the current uh, before the pulse. This is pre and post TMS. And we found this kind of double dissociation in the sense that when you stimulate dorsal attention, you get a bigger response in the AN than the MN. And when you stimulate the MN, you get a bigger response in the MN than the AN. It's not clear, it's obviously, it's not that you don't activate any other region or network in the brain, but there is some, some dissociation between these two. And the cool thing is that when you retest this after a month, this is visit one and visit two is after a month, you get very similar responses. You can see that the amplitude is like kind of different, but the timing, it's more or less the same. And you get still the double dissociation between the two. This is across 24 subjects. The cool thing to show the reliability of this is that if you look at single channel data, not source analysis, this is the data from single channel in the AG. These are again, blue is the first visit, red is after a month, different time of the day, we try to control it, but it's never the same time. But even though you have all these differences, you still get very similar potential. If you look at the visual cortex, you get the same exact thing, one month apart. So we think this might constitute a good biomarker. And one way to show that this is relevant is to look at subject with high specificity, so subject that show the dissociation, and subject, which are expected to be there in the group of subjects we have, don't have the specificity. So subject that activate both networks regardless of what you stimulate. So these are high specificity and almost no specificity. We look at this ratio, and then we correlate it with cognitive score of these participants. And the cool thing is that if you look at the correlation between cognitive score and spontaneous EEG of this participant, which you can see in black, the correlation with uh, fluid and crystallized intelligence, including IQ, is very low and not significant, all the black bars. But when you start correlating the dissociation between the network and the specificity after TMS with cognition, you get this. So all the correlation goes up a lot and you can classify participants based on their TMS EG response and the specificity of network response uh, and infer their cognitive level. If you look at the data after TMS, the data before, like we know, with EG, you don't find correlation with cognition. That's, that's a known finding. Uh, but it's kind of cool to think that if, you, again, like the show with consciousness, uh, patient with disorder of consciousness, if you perturb the brain, now you look at what happened right after TMS and you look at different networks, now you can, you know more about the cognitive profile of this participant than if you look at just spontaneous activity. So that was the main, the main finding of this. Obviously, there are many things that we should do, and we are looking at fingerprinting this TMS EG response with one whole stock. Um, and in particular, you can see here the difference. So we looked at simulation of the different regional networks. And here you can see two subjects and their two visits one month apart. Uh, and how the subject have high reliability between them, but they have completely different potential. So you cannot just do a group average of these responses. You lose a lot of information. Each participant is different and show different potentials. So this is something that we, we are exploring and we're trying to classify a participant based on, based on this and then we'll be moved to patients. But at the same time, we want to understand what, are, what can we infer from the functional connectome that explain propagation of TMS and G data, the same for structural, 
And this is what we discussed with Apple and Monty. So how can we do better source analysis and really capture data like uh, connectivity between nodes and, and stuff like that, which we, we, we didn't know how to do at the time. Um, and that's, that's the focus of what we're trying um, to do together. So that's, I think, that's it for the TMSG part, um, which is more about probing networks. Baseline electrical, you know, coordination uh, across the brain doesn't contain the same information that you get in pound one as you get part of the brain. Do you think it's just kind of blurred out by the fact that obviously at rest you've got activity across you know many networks in the brain all kind of happening, and especially when there are lack of localization ability, uh, yeah. you don't see it. Whereas when you pound on the brain, at least if you're interrogating a particular circuit, as you Sure. Mm -hmm. So you can bring out the future. So just, to me, at least, it seems surprising it's not somehow connected. I mean, there is a lot of data that says that it's not correlated. With resting state EEG data, you don't see almost anything. Exactly. But I agree. With, exactly. So I agree with you. I, I think if we find a way to decompose resting state data a bit better and maybe stabilize the brain state in which the participants are when they do resting state, which is never the same resting state for everyone. Uh, we might be able to squeeze out more information. I think it will not be the same that you can get if you sub the brain still. Uh, I think that gives you an edge. So that was about probing the brain. This is the part that I like the most, so manipulating networks. Um, I'm gonna show you something that try to respond to this question. So let's say you want to move the activity in one network or two networks or synchronize two networks. How do you do it? If you want to stimulate nodes, uh, how many nodes you need to engage to activate a network, which node. If you want to do it with edges, if you want to play with the interaction between node networks, how do you do it? Um, at the same time, if you want to reach subcortical structure, you want to reach the hippocampus, how do you do it? Uh, we are exploring this stuff with uh, Professor Barabasi and Nortista using control theory to define TMS targets to reach uh, hippocampus, uh, thalamus, and so on. But I'm gonna focus on this one by starting uh, from this. So edge-based associative stimulation. So the idea, I don't need to explain you by time independent plasticity, um, um, is that if you have uh, two neuronal pool or two neurons that tend to be co-activated over time, the strength of that connection increase. Uh, and we know that a crucial factor in this, in this uh, framework to make the strengthening of connectivity happen is the, uh, let's say spike timing, the delay in milliseconds between the activity of the two neurons or neuron population. So you need to, you have a, a sweet spot when you can really increase plasticity and association between the two neurons or neuron population. But then if you are out of that window, you don't. Uh, it's, it's a way weaker association. So the idea is that we might think of using this association and recreate this by zapping two regions of the brain by carefully selecting the nodes and do it over time, like 200 times in 20 minutes, and see if it changes the connectivity only within those two nodes, and we don't affect the rest of the brain. People have tried to do this, just to be clear, people have done it with two TMS coil, stimulating uh, left parietal cortex and left motor cortex. They use exactly the same framework, thinking that we can estimate the delay of information transfer between left parietal and left motor, which is around five to 10 milliseconds. So, what happens if we stimulate parietal first and motor after with a five millisecond delay and we do like pop, 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 200 times. They did this, and, but they also did as a control condition the opposite. They stimulate the motor cortex first and then the left parietal cortex. And we think that that's not the way the information goes at rest, so you shouldn't get a facilitation in that case. As an output in this case, they could only measure corticospinal excitability on the receiving end of the circuit on the motor cortex by doing TMS. So here, when they show that there is a facilitation when you do five milliseconds per associative stimulation, it means that after 200 pulses per pulses between the two regions, you increase corticospinal excitability of the receiving end of the motor cortex. When you do stimulation in the other way, you actually tend to decrease it a bit, or you could say that nothing happened. So this tells you that you can modulate the interaction between two brain regions, but you need to be sure about the timing, the direction in which you send the, the pair of pulses, and many other parameters. This is what we knew till a few years ago. So people have tried with 
in the model system, which is always a good place to start, or the visual system, what we wanted to do was to modulate uh, networks uh, in the brain, like the full mode, dorsal attention, frontal parietal, for which we have way less information about how they interact with each other. But I wanted to give it a try. I, I thought it was a, this could turn into an amazing tool for therapeutic application and to understand the brain in general. So we decided to target these two nodes. And basically, this is the design. This is a paper we published last summer. We have people come uh, at the center. This, this was done in Italy and then here. We individualized stimulation target for all of them. Then we did task fMRI with an attention task before, two resting state scans. And then in three different weeks, we used two coil and two neural navigation systems to stimulate dorsal attention, uh, the Fultman network and front operator control in three different ways. So one is uh, basically, it's, it's called it parietal frontal. The other one is frontal parietal. And this is the new condition when we stimulate both sides at the same time. So that shouldn't induce plasticity between the two regions. After this, we repeat the resting state, task activation, resting state. This is a zoom in of how we individualize the target for each participant. So you can see the left angular gyrus node of the photon network here, the different subjects with different targets, and the resulting targets in the prefrontal lobe. So for each one, we carefully selected this node, and then we look at the negative correlation in the prefrontal lobe. And for each participant, we pick the spot when we have the highest negative correlation with the default. So we are trying to target two networks that are negatively correlated uh, with each other. We did this for each participant, and the results were, were surprising in the sense that when you look at the connectivity of the left angular gyrus as a seed region, you find that the only region when you have a significant change is this one. And as you can see here, this is the connectivity between the two sites before TMS and after the TMS. And TMS, I mean 200 per pulses between the two regions. And as a delay, we use 10 milliseconds, which is a number that we didn't made up, but it's, it's what we approximated based on previous literature. That's where we could start working together, trying to define the parameter for this type of stimulation. Um, but again, we were able to modulate the connectivity between the two networks. And also an important point is that the amount of change in connectivity was predicted by the strength of the connectivity at baseline before we stimulated. So if you have very strongly correlated networks, it's more difficult to change that connectivity with the social stimulation compared to networks that have very weak uh, connectivity at baseline. Um, we also look at activation. I mean, we don't have time to look at all this stuff, but uh, we look at activation and we see a difference when you're stimulating one direction or the other. Um, we look at, we didn't see any behavioral effect, by the way. To be honest, we didn't see any change in the attention in the scanner, but we saw a difference in the activation patterns. Um, we also did some Granger causality to see, because I think this is the best measure to, to capture the effect of this type of stimulation, because you're changing the way region A influences region B. So you should do some sort of uh, uh, effective connectivity. And we saw a change in the same region. Uh, but I guess the most important thing that I want to share with you is the limitation. Uh, in terms of uh, the parameter space of this type of stimulation. So nobody has tried in patients. Uh, these are the first studies trying to modulate network with this approach. Uh, but I think this, if properly characterized, can be a huge uh, uh, tool in our hand to modulate connectivity with this leveraging the specificity of TMS that allow you to stimulate a specific node and not another, uh, and also the possibility of stimulating networks that are correlated, anti-correlated, and so on. Um, this might turn into a very powerful tool. But obviously, we don't know how to select the interstimulus interval, the famous 10 milliseconds or 5 milliseconds between the pulses. Um, we don't know. It can be based on structural connectivity. PMSCG data could help. Um, what the stimulation intensity on region A and B should be, people have done the same thing that people have done since the first study in 2003. Uh, stronger intensity in the first pulse, lower intensity in the second one. Nobody has tried to address all the different combination. The number of pulses, call orientation, many things. Um, we are trying to do something related to this uh, using structural connectivity with Davide, who is the student that will come here uh, and in my lab, by trying to use structural MRI to define some sort of conduction velocity and delay, estimating white matter tracks between the two regions that you stimulate. So to give an example, in this study, uh, which is a peripheral associative study, they stimulated the two motor cortices in, I think, 
15 participants. They tried different delays between the pulses and they found that the one that gives you the biggest effect is around 15 milliseconds. So we look at the data, we ask the, the authors for the coordinates, we est estimate the tracks between the two areas. And then for each participant, we approximate based on some uh, uh, quantification of myelination of fibers and so on, what is the track length and what is the conduction delay. And so we came up with a number which across different parameters that you can play with is around 11 or 12 milliseconds, which is not exactly 15, but it's not even 55 or two milliseconds. So we were pleased to see that we could maybe use structural MRI to infer the delay between two regions, but obviously this is super exploratory. And we tried to do this because I was frustrated about using delays that other people suggested, but obviously your, your expertise on this type of analysis and new ideas that could come up, uh, we could come up with to estimate this, it's, it's crucial. Uh, so I would really like to have your input on, on this. So just an extension of this thing before we talk about clinical stuff. Um, obviously, I, I, I think it's great to be able to modulate networks, but we need to find, again, some correlates in terms of explaining individual differences in cognition, in pathological symptoms, and so on. So we did a similar study, still with Davide, when we basically tried to stimulate not two nodes of two networks that are negatively correlated, but two nodes of the same network, which is the front of lateral control network here, uh, which are positively correlated. So now we are targeting within network connectivity, and we are trying to do the same thing. Um, the idea, though, is that you could use this tool to validate cognitive models that tell you that during a cognitive task, information usually goes from here to here and not the other way around. So now you could try to strengthen that specific connectivity or do the opposite and see if your behavioral performance goes up or down. So you can validate cognitive models in a sense. This is the model we try to validate. So people think that when you do an abstract reasoning task, you have more parietal frontal engagement. So information flow is more in this direction when you solve logical task and you end up with a big activation in the left LPFC. When you do relational reasoning, which is more like, uh, like something like this, you can see the difference in the stimuli here. Um, it's more frontal parallel. It's a more fit um, uh, forward kind of uh, CFD. So we have an idea, we have a model, we can find this region because we did a previous work and we mapped these networks and we know where to stimulate. So we try to do the same thing I showed you before. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, obviously it's a simplification, but people like to think when they look at fMRI activation and look at the timing of the activation. When you do logical reasoning, you see more of an activation in the frontal lobe. But if you look at the connectivity preceding that activation, it's preceded by parietal activation. That's where you analyze more the characteristics of the stimuli. Yeah. Mm. This is, that, that's the jump that we're doing here. So this is a model based on ima neuroimaging stuff that just tell you where to stimulate and what you should expect, in which direction you want to strengthen the connectivity. Then we stimulate and we measure behavior. Obviously, the ideal thing would be to do stimulation inside fMRI and see if we can really modulate that. Um, I understand that it's, it's a jump because we are trying to rely on data that is either from EG or fMRI and then measure other things. Um, in the case of the previous studies, we base it on fMRI dynamics and we measure change in fMRI dynamics. In this one, the output is behavior. So you will never know if you really modulate that. But the idea is, is that you have this, this, um, this differential pattern uh, of dominant activation. And so we did the same thing. We personalized the simulation sites and we tested even more conditions this time. Uh, so people came in five times different weeks we did simultaneous TMS, parietal frontal TMS from parietal to frontal, front to parietal TMS, prefrontal TMS only, and then no stimulation at all, so complete uh, stimulation. And then people were tested with both tasks, relational and logical, both before and after possession, everything. So these are the results that we just uh, published. Um, we think it's just an insight into the fact that we might be able to use this, this approach to validate these this cognitive hierarchies. 
Uh, obviously, the dissociation you get is not spe super specific and neat. So you get, when you stimulate parietal frontal, you were expecting to see uh, an increase in logical reasoning. And indeed, you see an increase in logical reasoning. This is the change in accuracy. When you do this condition, red one is parietal frontal, indeed. And you don't see an effect for the others. You actually have a decrease in performance when you do frontal parietal, the opposite part. When you do simulation following in the frontal parietal direction, you see an increase mostly in uh, relational reasoning, this one, this stimuli, but you also see something in logical ones. It's not significant, but I think it's there. So again, it's not a super neat, precise dissociation, but we were surprised that we could, first of all, induce a cognitive enhancement. So these people, uh, their, their, their cognition goes up compared to sham stimulation, placebo, no stimulation, frontal stimulation only. But also there seems to be some directionality there, which is a promising first step. Nobody has tried to do dual coil, further social stimulation and, and merge it with cognition. So we thought it was, it was worth giving it a, a try. So the last part, I think I need to rush. Uh, I will skip this one because I want to show you the clinical application, but this is an example of how we try with uh, Mike Fox, which you probably know, definitely know. We try to do the same thing with transcranial electrical stimulation, meaning that we, uh, I will just jump into this. So we try to use electrical stimulation, which usually come in the form of two big sponges. And we try to modulate connectivity, but as you can see, the resolution of transcranial electrical stimulation is not enough to modulate connectivity and engage specific nodes. So over the last few years, we have developed uh, an approach, so-called multifocal stimulation, when you basically use smaller electrodes, like these small disks here, that you can place strategically to engage networks. And originally we were using only eight, now we use 32 channels, uh, uh, brain stimulation devices, and we feed an fMRI activation pattern, for instance, to, in, uh, to the algorithm to optimize the placement of the electrodes. And we are trying to do this to modulate connectivity patterns. I don't need to show you all this stuff. I will show you an example um, in the brain tumor case. But the idea is that we can map functional connectivity even of subcortical structure and try to modulate this by carefully placing the electrodes uh, to suppress or excite the activity of different uh, regions. This is the study that we did with Mike three, four years ago. Uh, we basically try to show that if you stimulate the motor network with two big sponges, you get only an effect on this, the, motor net, the motor cortex that you stimulate, the left motor cortex in this case. But then we also try to optimize a multifocal stimulation that stimulates the entire resting state sensory motor network by placing the electrodes in a specific way like this. All anodal excitatory stimulation here and uh, inhibitory stimulation on the rest of the brain. So we compare the two conditions, and what you can see here is that you, when you do the two big sponges, you get the same traditional effect, which is an increase in cortical spinal excitability only on the left motor cortex, which is the one that you stimulate, and nothing on the right. So there's no change here in cortical spinal excitability. But when you do stimulation on the entire motor strip, you see an effect which is actually bigger uh, on both sides. So you engage both nodes of the network on the left and the right uh, hemisphere. The thing is, when we did the study, it was only based on cortical spinal excitability assessment, so we didn't know what was going on in the brain. So we uh, bought an MRI-compatible device, and we put it in the scanner, and we repeated the same uh, thing during fMRI recording, ASL and fMRI. I'm going to show you just the fMRI results, but the design is exactly the same. Uh, the paper is under revision now. So we stimulate left motor cortex or the entire motor network. And the thing that, that I think is more fascinating is, uh, the first one is kind of obvious. So when you do multifocal network-based stimulation, you engage more of the right component compared to bifocal stimulation. But during stimulation, these are two fMRI done during stimulation inside the scanner, and one done after. So it's obvious because in the multifocal condition, we stimulate both motor cortices. In the other one, we only stimulate one. So you would expect this. But the cool thing is this. So you saw from the montage that we excite the entire sensory motor network, but we try to inhibit the rest of the brain. So we went and looked at negatively correlated nodes between the one that we stimulate, the sensory motor network, and the rest of the brain. And we found that when you do multifocal stimulation, you not only increase the activation of both motor cortices, 
but you actually also increase the negative correlation between motor cortex and the rest of the brain. So it's a within network effect and a between network effect, which is similar to what we were doing with TMS before, but in this case, the advantage is that it's done with a device that you can put into the scanner, it's portable, you can give it to the patient, they can do it at home. So the idea of modulating both network within and between, it's kind of an appealing one, and, and we were nicely surprised that you can get something also with, with uh, electrical stimulation. We are, doing, we are trying also to do multifocal TMS, which I know that's something that, that Apple is trying to do too. Uh, we are collaborating with Lasto Parabasi and Northeastern to use network control theory to define the placement of multiple coil up to five to reach subcortical structure like uh, hippocampus or, or other uh, structure. We have another one submitted one uh, now. We should be able to in these days to work with this. Last thing, I know that we are a bit late. How much time I have? Five minutes, two minutes, no minutes? Five, okay. Yeah, five or six. Okay, I'll show you two, two clinical applications, which I think are less related to networks, but that's where I would like to have your input because these are really new things. Uh, so multifocal DCS in brain tumors. Uh, this is the evidence where we started. These are two examples of translational stuff that we are doing, starting from animal work and jumping into patients, doing the best we can to do the right thing. So there are, there's work showing that in bodily tumor, animal models, but also in human in patients, if you inject direct current stimulation in the tumor or in the tissue surrounding the tumor, you can induce a decrease in perfusion with intensity of stimulation similar to what we use for TTCS, for brain stimulation. And if you continue doing this for over time, you induce necrosis of the tumor. So at the same time, we know, we kind of know, that TTCS, uh, when done in humans, during ASL recording, for instance, tends to modulate perfusion in the human brain. So the idea was as simple as it, as you can see here, can we use TTCS in patients with brain tumors like glioblastoma or metastasis from lung cancer to decrease the perfusion of the tumor so that we basically choke the tumor. So you, you decrease perfusion over time and you might induce even necrosis, but that would require a longer exposure. But the first results we want to see is can we modulate perfusion in brain tumors? So why I'm showing you this is because this is another example of this multifocal application. So this paper just got accepted from a student, student of mine that is now here in Boston. Uh, this is a nice, nice way to show what we are doing and how we approach this problem. So for brain tumors, for instance, which is the, 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 the more messy uh, scenario you can imagine, you have the tumor, you trace the tumor in the necrotic core, the solid tumor, and the edema. And then we use uh, uh, biophysical modeling to maximize the stimulation on the solid part of the tumor without affecting the rest of the brain or even the necrotic core inside. So we did all this in patients with glioblastoma and metastasis, and we stimulated this patient two days before surgery inside the MRI scanner for 20 minutes. And we recorded both ASL and fMRI to see if we could uh, modulate perfusion in these patients. At the same time, in a few selected patients, we did it after surgery. But we have to optimize to avoid all the current that is going to go through the breaches in the skull that you get after surgery. The current, you go there, and your biophysical model is not reliable anymore. So this is what we did for pre-surgery uh, stimulation, and the only important thing is here. So if you use this A-channel montage and you personalize for each patient, you can see that you kind of induce, based on biophysical model, which we know it's only numbers and pictures, so you need to validate it. But according to the model, we were really inducing the maximum amount of stimulation in the red area here, which is the solid tumor, compared to the necrotic core and the rest of the brain. You can see it here. The same thing was done uh, after surgery, when we use CT scan to basically model the breach in the skull and see where the current would go. And as you can see, it's a bit messy, but it's still close to the tumor, the residual part of the tumor after surgery. So long story short, uh, the paper should be online on August 14th. We were able to appreciate a decrease in perfusion in the solid part of the tumor. Uh, it was selective for the solid part of the tumor, it was not in the edema, and we also picked some control region in the same hemisphere on the other hemisphere, and we didn't see any change in the fusion, but also I don't think we have the data here, you can find it in the paper, we didn't see any change in fMRI uh, activity, which is a known phenomenon in brain tumors, is uh, neural decoupling between what you see with perfusion and what you see with, with fMRI. 
So this is another example of how we can apply this multifocal stimulation to, to do something at the clinical level. Um, now we have another one uh, um, application with, with Brigham, Dana Farber, and many others to do this over time, multiple days in the same patients. Last thing, I promise it will be a minute, but it's the most important one. It's um, work I'm doing on gamma oscillation and Alzheimer. So basically, I don't know how much you know about Alzheimer, but one of the main theories in the last 10 years is that you have an, uh, an inflammatory response, and this is partly due to activation of deactivation, like, like uh, uh, impairment of a specific class of interneurons called parvalbumin-positive interneurons, which usually when they work properly, they generate activity around 40 hertz, differently from pyramidal neurons, which generate around 8 hertz. So, theta alpha H. This is obviously gamma activity, as you know better than me, and people think that this deficit in paravalbum interneurons is the key component of Alzheimer's disease and the lack of inhibition in the brain of Alzheimer's patient and uh, the increase in seizure because, because gamma activity has a protective uh, kind of value against uh, epileptic form activity. So we should go after these interneurons and gamma uh, activity. Uh, to modulate cognition and clinical symptoms and so on in patients. We know that these parvalbumin interneurons are really relevant for gamma oscillation because people have, done, have tested this with optogenetics. So you suppress parvalbumin interneurons to decrease gamma, you activate them to increase gamma. If you do it in different parts of the brain, you systematically induce in animal models uh, a cognitive uh, uh, effect, behavioral effect. But the most important thing is this work, which I'm pretty sure you're familiar with from MIT in 2016, when they showed that indeed in an animal model of Alzheimer, if you induce gamma activity, you not only activate parvalbum interneurons, but you also activate microglia. And when you do the right frequency of stimulation compared to control condition, you actually induce a decrease in amyloid in the brain. So induce amyloid clearance. A follow-up study this year, earlier this year, published in Cell, showed that they also decreased tau protein, and you also get behavioral effects and improvement in memory. So this is considered the new holy grail of Alzheimer's treatment. We need to induce gamma in the, in the Alzheimer's brain and, and measure microglia and so on. So that's what we're trying to do. That's why I want to show it with you. Uh, we think that by reactivating gamma oscillations at this level of the cascade, pathophysiological cascade in Alzheimer, we might be able to stop amyloid accumulation and tau accumulation and improve clearance. The fascinating thing is that if you look at different diseases in the neuro, neuropsychiatry realm, you see the same gamma deficits in schizophrenia, Alzheimer, autism, TBI, and so on. So this gamma hypothesis might be relevant for many conditions. So how do we do this? How are we doing this? Basically, we are using PACS. It's a form of electrical stimulation that uh, improves specific brain oscillations, like gamma oscillations. We have worked a lot with this over the last few years, but this is an example of how it works. So if you have spontaneous firing in neurons and you apply this external perturbation, which is a sinusoid with a specific frequency, neurons tend to fire at the rhythm that we induce from the outside. This is a paper in neurons from Flavio Frolich in 2010. If you change the frequency of stimulation, neurons tend to follow, and so you generate entrainment and you can induce specific oscillations in the brain. We have done this in many studies in healthy controls just to try to boost cortical excitability, memory, attention, intelligence, and so on over the years, starting with my first work and my PhD here. Um, so we know that we can induce this gamma oscillation. And th the cool thing is that five of these papers were actually at 40 years, the same frequency that they use in the Alzheimer model. So for us, it was like easy to connect the dot and say, okay, let's stimulate Alzheimer patient with 40 year stimulation. And we decided to target the region when you have amyloid in the brain, which is, this is the typical pattern that you see in amyloid in Alzheimer's patient. So this is what we are doing, basically. We are, uh, have the patient come in, they do amyloid scan, it can be PID or PID or Frolbetavir. We do an high resolution mapping of where they have amyloid. Then we basically threshold the map and we see a region where they have more amyloid, like here in the right temporal and frontal lobe. And then we basically optimize stimulation montages for each one of these patients, like we have now 15. Uh, and for each one of them, you get a different montage to maximize the stimulation when they have more amyloid and minimize it over the rest of the brain. 
This is what we have done in the first trial starting in 2017. Uh, it's kind of, I like to show this because we went really fast. So 2016, the first evidence published, we got in contact with MIT, we decided to give it a try, and in 2017, we started the trial. You can see that we did this for two weeks every day, and then we repeated PET, MRI, neuropsychological assessment after the treatment. After this, we basically got in contact with DARPA. DARPA approached us because they saw some preliminary results and they wanted to expand this. And that's where some of you here might have an interest because they wanted to look at different proteins in the brain, including tau, but they also want to look at microglia PET uh, imaging, uh, like with PBR28. So we tried to put together another trial when we are doing all this measurement and we are doing it with Georgia Fakri at MGH. We are doing P, tau, and PBR28 before and after four weeks of TACS every day for an hour. We stimulate this region at 40 years in Alzheimer's patients. Results, two slides. Uh, from the first 15 patients, the results is really, really encouraging. Uh, all of them tolerated the visits. Nobody dropped out. They, didn't, they missed four visits out of 200. Uh, they're really excited about the therapy because differently from TMS, electrical stimulation, you barely feel it on the scalp. So it's nice. We, we have them watching documentary on National Geographic when they are in the room and they receive stimulation. So for them, it's really something that they could do also at home. Um, that's a crucial component for, for a clinical trial to be successful uh, and for specifically this type of population. But when you measure cognition, we see a one point decrease in other score. So the lower, the better in this case. Uh, an increase in MOCA, an increase in activities of daily living. Uh, so there is an effect. Um, a lot of patients, mostly caregivers and friends, contact us saying that they see a change in this patient. It's kind of surprising. The dentist call and say, he's different. He came here every six months for the last 10 years, and now all of a sudden he's a different person. He's asking questions. Uh, so we don't know if it's a placebo effect or the stimulation, but... Um, um, it's kind of nice that we appreciate all these changes, like he's back to where he was one, two years ago, symptomatically. Um, it's kind of nice. Uh, at the same time, when you measure if you did anything to the brain, we induce a change in, uh, obviously we record the EG before and after, but also every day before and after each treatment. Uh, we see an increase in gamma oscillations. And uh, the question here for you is like, we use EG to measure gamma, and you probably know that that's the worst scenario you want to be into when you look at the EG data because gamma is messy, it's contaminated by movement, muscular activity. These patients move all the time. They're drowsy. So I would really like to develop something together with you, maybe using MEG or anything else you can think of to understand really if my therapy with TSCS in gamma is modulated, is modulating gamma. Because when we clean the data, we are confident we are seeing more gamma but it can be many things. Uh, the thing is that this change in gamma is correlated with changing cognition, which reassure us that it might be real. Um, but given what is the, what's at stake, like a new potential therapy for Alzheimer's, I would like to put all my energy uh, on this. Uh, I'm gonna show you this, very controversial. This is the results on one patient, believe it or not. Uh, this is what gave us the, the input to continue. This is a PET scan with flow beta for six months before the therapy because it was participating into another study. This is the day two weeks before TSCS, and this is after TSCS. This is the analysis we did at our center. This is the analysis for the radiology department at PADMC, completely blinded. They see the same thing. So we see a significant reduction of amyloid after the therapy and a gradual increase in amyloid in six months before, which is what you would expect in this patient They keep accumulating proteins. So it's very promising, and now we have a lot, that's why I'm saying that we should collaborate because we have a lot of resources, including partnership with people here, like Brad Dickerson. Um, we have trial, we have completed the first two trials, now I have another one to do those response of TACS in these patients. We have a known-based TACS trial where we will collect MRI, PET, in all these studies we do PET and MRI and genetic, everything you can think of, TMSG, uh, before and after. So we have an insane amount of data. Um, we do it in front of them for dementia, we are trying schizophrenia, many other things. Just to rush through the end, because I'm really... Uh, the, the only other thing that we are trying is to do exactly what they did in the animal model at MIT, which is not just optogenetic stimulation, but they also try with flickering lights. So if you do flickering lights or auditory stimulation in gamma at 40 years, you can induce gamma activity. 
So we are trying the same thing in humans by having flickering panels and auditory stimulation and doing amyloid PET and tau before and after. So about the, the, to close about this gamma thing, I think it's very, very promising. We should try to find a way to work together. The thing that I found most fascinating is the closed loop stimulation with EG and TSCS to send gamma bars when you actually need it and not stimulate continuously. We want to do stimulation during sleep because sleep is the moment when you clear more amyloid. So that's the moment when we should stimulate. We want to improve target identification via PET. Uh, and I know you have an amazing expertise here with PET analysis. We don't know anything about it. Um, and then I'm trying to do something even crazier, uh, which I think is cool to share. So going to space, meaning, I know it sounds crazy, but a lot of stuff that happened in space to astronauts when they go stay in space for six months or one year, it's similar to what we see in Alzheimer's. So I was approached by this um, astronaut, Yvonne Cagle, is an MD. Um, she wants to investigate this. And so we start working together. I visited the NASA facility last April and going to another one in California now. We are working with her and Ralph Pelligra, um, who is the chief medical officer at NASA Ames, uh, to develop brain stimulation application in space as a countermeasure, not just for neurodegeneration, but also for other things. Uh, I think this is fascinating if you want to talk about this. I can talk for hours. I love it. This is the last slide, I promise. So <laughs> I could continue for 10 hours. Uh, so many things I show you. I'm sorry if it's very long and, and maybe boring, but I, I would love to share everything I can with you. So the first thing is brain stimulation with TMS and EG. I think is a potential good biomarker, but we need to find ways to, to optimize targeting and ways to do source analysis better. For associative stimulation, this is the thing that I think we have most in common. So it's a huge parameter space. We can use imaging to define targets, imaging to define the delay between the two pulses. It's, it's a huge space. And I've been talking with NIH, a program officer there, um, Oli Lizambi, basically NIMH. She really likes it. She's waiting for us to send something about this petrosolative stuff, but it needs to be solid. So I'm thinking about the first study when we test all the parameters systematically. Uh, and we could team up together to do it. And then multifocal stimulation, I think we should move to stimulating with 32 channels. It's something that we can test together, and I would like to test TSCS uh, with, with MEG uh, to see if we can induce gamma. Obviously, this is not just my work. I have a big team here in Boston. A lot of people are not in the slide, unfortunately. And I have another team in Italy, and I move all the students from there to here and vice versa. And sorry, it was really long. Thank you for your attention. Yes,